Good morning, family. I want to thank you this morning for joining Pleasant Hope Baptist Church online worship experience. I'm Deacon Daniel White, and on behalf of Reverend Dr. Heber Marvin Brown III, I want to thank you for joining us this morning. I hope you are ready for a wonderful day in the Lord. We have a very special guest, Reverend Shonda Gladden, who will be bringing a word this morning. Thank you, family. We look forward to talking with you soon.
Good morning, family. I'm Deacon Daniel White, and let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this day that you've given us, God. God, you've waking us up this morning, Lord. For that, we say thank you, Lord. You've been our provider, Lord. You've given us strength when we are weak, Lord. And for that, we say thank you, Lord. And even now, Lord, after all the things we, that is going on in the world, Lord, you are still right there, Lord, showing your strength and your mighty power, Lord. But Lord, we know a lot of us are going through a lot of things right now, Father. And Lord, we just give it to you, God, because we know, God, that all power lies in your hands. So, Lord, I pray for all those in Pleasant Hope today, God, for everyone watching, Lord. May you strengthen them, God. May you continue to be with them and give them what they need, Lord. For you know all hearts and minds, Lord. And I pray all the saints, Lord, continue to offer up prayers to you, Father. Because, Lord, we need prayers in this world today, God, in this dark world that we see, Lord. But, Lord, we know that there is light at the end, Lord. And we're going to continue to go towards that light, walk on that narrow path, Father. So, Lord, I pray, Lord, for strength right now, God, because we know that the devil is, is busy, Lord. Lord, we know, Lord, that the devil's knocking on doors, God, through our minds when we're at our homes, Lord. While we're at home working, Lord, our health is declining, Father. But, God, we know, Lord, that you, Lord, this is not the first rodeo, Lord. This is not the first time that we've been in this situation, Father. And we're going to continue to hold on to your word, hold on to your promises, Lord. And know, Lord, that you are right there in the midst, Lord, where two or three are gathered together, Lord. So here we are calling on you, Lord, knowing that you are in the midst today, Father. And we thank you, Lord, for being right there, never leaving nor forsaking us, Father. So, Lord, I pray, God, that you continue to strengthen your saints, Lord. And I thank you today for this branch of Zion called Pleasant Hope, Lord. And I pray for our pastor, Lord, while he's on his sabbatical, God. I pray for the young people, Lord, who are taking initiative and taking front and center, Lord, and doing your work, Father. I thank you, Lord, for grooming them, God. I thank you, Lord, for the preachers you have coming before us, Father. Can you continue to bless them, God, and strengthen them, Lord? For, Lord, we know that the devil's talking, God. They're talking, Lord. But it's okay, God, because we know, Lord, that the victory's already won, Lord, and in the precious son of your, of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord. We thank you, God. So Lord, I pray, Lord, you continue to be with us today. As we go about this day, God, may you bless this service today. And we thank you in all that you do. We offer up this prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Pleasant Hope. My name is Ethan Brown I. Today I am reading Isaiah chapter 41, verses 8 through 10. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, You are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church family. My name is Talia Day, and on behalf of our pastor, Reverend Dr. Heal Brown III, I would like to welcome you all to today's worship service at Pleasant Hope Baptist Church. I am so excited to introduce this week's guest pastor, Reverend Shawna Nicole Gladden. Reverend Gladden writes books, she fights for under-resourced communities, preaches, and even sings. Reverend Gladden encourages us to become our best selves. We each have God-given gifts that we can use in the world. Reverend Gladden teaches us that we should not compare ourselves but strive to become better people. In the spirit of her long-term teachings, I would like to end with the lyrics of one of her songs. I'm not what I used to be. I'm not quite what I will be. Becoming. I'll keep becoming. Thank you, Reverend Gladden, for all that you do and welcome to Pleasant Hope Baptist Church.
Salutations to you, the Pleasant Hope Baptist Church in Baltimore, Maryland. I am the Reverend Shonda Nicole Gladden, uh, the associate pastor here at Crossroads AME Church in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I am grateful for this opportunity to stand before you, even if it is virtual. Uh, this morning, please allow me to thank the pastor of this great church, my beloved brother and friend for more than 20 years, the Reverend Dr. Heber Brown III and his gorgeous bride, Shante Brown. Sis, I love you and I I appreciate you for you both for your warm welcome and invitation and even your virtual hospitality. I must say thank you to each of you holding these things down these 12 Sundays that Pastor Brown is taking a much needed sabbatical. Uh, to the good members of Crossroads AME Church, especially the tech ministry, Brother Michael Jefferson Sr., uh, who has helped to make sure that this could come to pass, along with the senior pastor here, Reverend Jerry E. Davis III, and his lovely wife, First Lady Kiana Davis. Uh, they have permitted me the great latitude to serve alongside them while I journey through this PhD program. And I do not take it lightly nor for granted uh, that I have access to such a pulpit for such a time as this. Now, friends, uh, allow me to give a, a bit of a disclaimer of sorts. Um, as we are here on Valentine's Day, <laughs> and preachers generally take the opportunity to attempt to eloquently recapitulate the many things we say and do that make love real in the lives of hearers. And so some of you may have tuned in to see if we would be talking about that thing. Others of you may have tuned in to see, can the preacher bring it? And still others may be anticipating an erudite elocution of current events, punctuated by a prophetic enunciation of proposed future steps. Brothers and sisters, and can I cannot promise you that I will provide any of the aforementioned, but I do commit to humbly offer some public thoughts that have been brewing in my spirit, hopefully with a measure of scholarship that gives credence to the fact that I'm on my way to become Dr. Gladden. I trust uh, and beg of you that you will be kind to me in your assessment of whatever God does here. Uh, grant me patience and mercy in the event that where we land is different than what you came for. I promise you there'll be another Valentine's Day next year and there'll even be another Sunday next week and hopefully you can find what you're looking for if it doesn't happen here. But for now, uh, won't you pray with me and for me? Uh, pray in the tongue and to the one for whom you your soul sings and your meditations may be heard. Let us pray. God, we need you to do it for if you don't do it, it won't be done. So please, God, 
do it again. Jesus, in your name and in the power of the Spirit, I pray. And together, let us say amen. I love you for sentimental reasons. I hope you do believe me. I've given you my heart because love makes things happen. You never know what you're going to do whenever true love takes over you. And I, I will always love you. And I love you just the way you are. <laughs> We say these things, we sing these things, we catalog these songs into the greatest love songs of all time. At least that's what a CNN article suggests. But what do we truly know from these sappy snippets about uh, what we have termed the word love? As I considered what word there might be appropriate for this gathered assembly this morning, I pondered the theme that your pastor has stated you all are considering in this season, operationalizing our pursuit of personal growth toward collective power. And I considered the theme, and like James Weldon Johnson in the creation, or perhaps the Mesopotamian Genesis account of the creation, I said, it's good. <laughs> Yet, as I consider the fact that operationalizing and systematizing anything requires an optic orientation that moves beyond acknowledgement of blind spots to revolutionize the way the eye takes in information, how it pro processes said information and communicates with the brain a new way of seeing all together. And I heard the familiar words of an old gospel school jam. Do you want a revolution? <laughs> Pleasant hope. Do you want a revolution? Uh, left me if you have a moment to take a journey down on the theme, a revolutionary love. Uh, Ken, comrades, and friends, revolution by definition is a forcible overthrow of something or someone in favor of a new system. It is to assert a new normal in place of what has become commonplace. It is to shift that which has been dominant to a position of inferiority for the sake of that which has historically been on the underside. A few weeks ago, we saw what was an attempt coup, an insurrection by white supremacists at the Capitol. They were attempting a revolution. Uh, we see and we know that their conception, if you will, of what the underside look like may not be consistent with what we see and experience. But on this second Sunday in the month of February 2021, I want to suggest that we can only operationalize and systematize our pursuit of personal growth toward collective power when we acknowledge our blind spots and revolutionize how we do our work. Uh, brothers and sisters, do you want a revolutionary love? This morning, uh, allow us to ground these thoughts uh, in the gospel according to John, the 15th chapter, verses 9 through 17, where in the New Revised Standard Version, these words are found. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in my father's love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you and no one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you to go 
and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. Thus far ends the reading of God's holy word for the people of God, and we together say thanks be to God. Uh, Friends, much of the Bible is penned out of a contextual experience of Greco-Roman culture. Common to Greco-Roman culture was the notion of household codes. These household codes gave men unilateral authority over their wives and their slaves and adult children. So biblical passages about submission and authority, such as wives submitting to their husbands, slaves obeying their masters, these are not, as Christians assume, rooted in a culture epitomized by June Cleaver's kitchen, but rather in a culture epitomized by the Greco-Roman and household codes. This system has dominated our understanding of Christian living for centuries because of the overarching influence of the Greco-Roman culture out of which the biblical writers were birthed. As Sharon Dowd has observed, the apostles advocated this system not because God had revealed it as the divine will for Christian homes, but because it was the only stable and respectable system anyone knew anything about. It was the best that the culture had to offer at the time. I say all of this not to suggest that the Bible is any less authoritative because of the context out of which our instructions were given. The Bible, though flawed, it is still authoritative. Best believe I still believe the Bible. But that said, at the risk of being presumed heretical, I'm not sure that the prevailing interpretations of the Bible are are at the best our culture has to offer. What is the best our culture has to offer? Are we bound to systems that cage and discard impoverished children to extend power and influence to the privileged? Are we bound to systems where government officials can knowingly allow pollutants to flow through pipes and cause devastatingly life-changing diseases to shorten the lifespans of children? It is the best we have to offer, maximizing school-to-prison pipelines through disproportionately matted out and aggressive egregiously enforced discipline for children whose families are poor, brown, black, or se hablo espanol. What is the best our culture has to offer? Comrades and kin, the religious mores and norms to which we ascribe are derived of a different cultural and eschatological time. Uh, Through time and history, they've been shaped, and at times they've been appropriated and sometimes honored by people, some who did the very best they could with what they had. And therefore, I believe in as much as God is still speaking, I am confident that now we have better. We know better. Uh, We have you. We have millennial leaders like Sister Talia Day who dances liturgically for the Lord. We have experienced the richness of what it means to, to live in communities of difference and we are capable of greater works. You watching even right now, you may be kissed by the sun or you may be melanin deficient, but greater works are available to us. Greater works that see little black girls and little white girls jumping double dutch and playing patty cake together in the authenticity of their different skins and like McDonald's loving it. A greater work that sees white privilege being employed subversively for the sake of brown and black people around the globe so that the systemic validity of whiteness is dismantled from the inside out. Greater works means calling for a collective outrage in the face of injustice, whether the victim looks like you or me or not. Greater works like this, like us, one nation, indivisible, under God, with liberty and justice for all. If we are going to have revolutionary love, We must work out our faith through love to accomplish justice for all. 
Much like our text this morning, we see that love is a many splendid thing. That as the gospel writer talks there to the people, he the gospel writer suggests that it is through love and by love and with love that the gospel writer was called to do the very thing to which the writer was called. Beloved brothers and sisters, comrades and kin, I, I wonder this morning, do you know to what you are called? Do you know to what God is speaking into your spirit right now? I believe that if you are attentive, that you will hear the whisperings of revolutionary love, revolutionary love that looks at our work of faith and love to overcome evil, overcoming the evil of simply talking about being faithful, to live into the good of walking out our faithfulness. In the last days, according to the book of Revelations, we are told that we will overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. In the tradition of my upbringing, I wanna engage in a little practice of testifying, if it's all right with you. Uh, you see, I serve in the state of Indiana uh, a, a, as part of an entity called the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Uh, uh, poor people make up the majority of the world's population. Despite this reality, poor people are by and large disenfranchised, displaced, and dismissed by the world and its systems. Here in Indiana, there are 2.9 million poor and dispossessed people. 2.9 million Hoosiers live subject to systems that are intentionally constructed to keep poor people poor. Poverty is such a system through which poor people are disenfranchised, displaced, and dismissed. But poverty, friends, does not discriminate, but, but systems do. Uh, poverty does not care if one is white, black, able-bodied, differently abled, immigrant, native-born, Republican, Democrat, or even independent. Yet and still systemic poverty overwhelmingly impacts black and brown people, immigrants who look on, on those who are differently able. You see, I bought my first house right there in the city of Baltimore. And while I have moved on from that Coppin Heights community that I loved when I planted my family there for a season, I, I still understand the ways that Poplar Grove and Baker Street look different uh, than if we were to take a drive down uh, to Lexington, uh, if we were to take a drive down uh, to the Inner Harbor, if we were to take a drive over to Fells Point. I understand that East Cold Spring and Hillen Road, while it may now be the home of the national treasure, uh, my fair beloved alma mater, the Morgan State University, I do understand that gentrification in Baltimore City is still very real. And now more than ever, we need revolutionary love pouring out in the cities of Baltimore, in the city of Indianapolis, in the cities wherein we may be found now more than ever. We, we need revolutionary love. When I think of revolutionary love, I, I immediately think of those stalwart civil rights leaders of the past. I, I think of Fannie Lou Hamer. I think of Ida B. Wells. I think of even Sister Outsider Audre Lord. I think even of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And now I think even of a man like your pastor, Reverend Dr. Heber Brown III. Uh, but, but, but can I let you know that America has a tricky way of sanitizing the narratives we tell of our revolutionaries, particularly particularly after our systems have killed them in the flesh or even in the spirit. We get warm and fuzzy about the dream and the drum major instinct of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But it was his work with the original Poor People's Campaign, much like what I'm doing, that got him killed. It was his decision to shine a light on how systemic poverty impacts housing and employment in America that triggered the government's actions that contributed to his murder. 
Some scholars would even suggest that the Poor People's Campaign was an integral shift in the martyrdom of civil rights leaders, those killed by state-sanctioned and state-influenced violence between 1954 to 1968. Reverend George Lee, one of the first black people registered to vote in Humphreys County, Mississippi, he used his pulpit and his printing press to urge others to vote. And white officials offered Lee protection on the condition that he end his voter registration efforts. But Lee refused and he was murdered. Uh, uh, Lamar Smith on August 13th, 1955 was shot dead on the courthouse lawn by a white man in broad daylight while dozens of people watched. The killer was never indicted because no one would admit they saw a white man shoot a black man. According to the Southern Poverty Law Center, Smith had organized blacks to vote in a recent election and his prize was murder. John Earl Reese, 16 years old, he was dancing in a cafe on October 22nd, 1955, when white men fired shots into the windows, killing him dead and wounding two others. And the shootings were part of an attempt by whites to terrorize blacks into giving up plans for a new school. Now, brothers and sisters, comrades and kin, many of us know the names of Adam May, Addie Mae Collins and Denise McNair and Carol Robertson and Cynthia Wesley, these four black girls who were getting ready for church services when a bomb exploded at the 16th Street Baptist Church, killing all four of these school-aged babies because their church had been a center for civil rights meetings and marches, much like Pleasant Hope. But, but fast forward to 2014, when the Ferguson, Missouri protests following the brutal killing of Mike Brown, DeAndre Joshua's body was found inside a burned car, blocks from Ferguson's protests. The 20-year-old had been shot in the head before the car was torched. Darren Seals was shown on video comforting Brown's mother that same night, and he met an almost identical fate two years later. The 29-year-old's bullet riddled, riddled body was found inside a burned car on September of 2016. Four others also died. Three of them ruled suicides. Marshawn McCorell of Columbus, Ohio, we speak your name. Edward Crawford Jr., 27, in May 2017, we speak your name. Trials and tribulations endured by the vulnerable among us and embedded in systems is killing our comrades. And the trauma of living afterwards is even more brutal. Beloved, on this second Sunday in Black History Month, I do not read through and share these poignant points of our painful past to cause you to feel any ways less encouraged. But I do so to remind us that many a day has gone on since many of those disparities have been wrought against us. But I want to suggest today on this second Sunday in 2021 of the month of February, that we must still have our eyes awake to the reality of what is going on around us. That we must still understand that even now we have systems that are being deployed against brown and black and poor people trying to take our very lives. That we must understand that where we live determines if our local supermarket will carry fresh fruits and vegetables. It determines determines our schools and which children our children uh, which our children will attend it determines our access to businesses and transportation options it determines all of what we have access to but pleasant hope you embody the revolutionary love you embody what God has available for the people of Baltimore City. And so I want to suggest that if you and I would understand that God is calling you in this season to operationalize and systematize for the very, very essential pursuit of the common personal growth that will lead to this community impact. That I believe you will see that as my faith tradition reminds me, 
that when we see hegemonic and economic gentrification ultimately changing the demographic of those who can and do control the resources of community through various disenfranchisement, that they must be confronted. That people of faith of every tradition must come together on the common theme that we all hold together, and that is love. Where is the love <laughs> when blatant discrimination persists? Where is the love when the perpetuation of systems to stand in the way of anyone's right to live? Where is the love? You see, my faith tradition reminds me that the world will only know of my status as a follower of the way of Jesus Christ by my love. For love lifts me up where I can stand. <laughs> where all of us can stand is that plateau called love. Yet so far as any of us is confronted by discrimination in housing and employment and disenfranchisement of voter rights and intolerance of LGBTQ Q plus people, we have failed to demonstrate pure, true, true love. And so I ask you again, are you ready for revolutionary love? Do you want a revolution? I recommend revolutionary love is the way there. I I'm almost through. I, I love that your pastor is a farmer. <laughs> I, I call him an agri-activist. And as I considered how to close this sermon today, I was reminded of a story of a farmer that goes like this that there once was a farmer who was having a celebration of all the animals on the farm. And for the celebration, he invited each animal to contribute to the meal. The cow was invited to attend the meal and the farmer said, I'd like for you to bring some of your great milk. We can celebrate if we can just have a good quantity of your milk to go around. And Mr. Cow said, I can't wait. Thank you for the invitation. I'll be there with my milk. <laughs> the farmer went on over to the goats and said, I'm having a celebration. I truly want you there. And I'd love it if you'd be so kind as to bring some of your cheese. Goat's milk cheese is going to go well with the milk from our friend, Mr. Cow. And the Mrs. Goat said, I'd be delighted to come and share my goat's cheese milk. The farmer went to all the animals on the farm and proceeded to invite them to the great celebration. The hens were excited to bring their eggs. The cows were giddy to bring their milk. The goats were overjoyed to be bringing their cheese. But then the farmer went to the hogs. And the farmer said to the hogs, we'd love to have some of your delicious bacon for our celebration. And the hogs got a little antsy that they didn't immediately respond. The, the farmer insisted, your bacon would really make our festivities something special. Won't you please join in with others and bring us some of your great bacon? Well, the hog had to decline the farmer's invitation. And the farmer didn't seem to understand. And that farmer went away downcast that the hog had said no. It wasn't until the entire farm came together for the great celebration that the lambs who also didn't bring anything to eat to the celebration but still came, let the gathering in on a secret. Some celebrations, some systems, some gatherings require more than just a byproduct from the willing participants. The hog couldn't send bacon without being fully committed. Beloved, the colonial project of America has consistently demanded that black and brown people, the differently abled, the poor, the dispossessed, all give all they have in order to be present in this system. But I wonder if there's anybody on the internet today uh, who understands that some revolutions uh, hinge too heavily on the bodies uh, of those for whom the system expects to be all in. Uh, and some of us uh, who are brave, uh, some of us uh, who are wise, uh, some of us who understand justice must say no to the system.
and not just no, but perhaps there if I may even say, hell no. Because sometimes love has to say no in order for the system to understand the demand is too great. The commitment is imbalanced until the workers in the capitalist economy can unite to say no to the system that demands too much from them and those who have and understand their role in the economy to share in their abundance take up the slack love workers into new realities the systems will win but but i believe in the city of baltimore i believe right there in east baltimore that there are enough people who truly believe in revolutionary love. I just believe that in the city of Baltimore, like the hymn writer said, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But love lifted me. I just believe that there's somebody in the internet who can testify like me that love lifted you. Love lifted me. And I'm, I'm so glad about it. I'm glad that that love wrapped itself in flesh and came through the birth canal of a young unmarried girl uh, said to have been a virgin, uh, betrothed to Joseph, uh, a, a poor girl with lowly reports. Uh, I'm so glad that love uh, wrapped itself up in flesh uh, and came and dwelt among humanity uh, and humanity rejected love even then. Uh, but love kept persisting. Uh, love said that greater love hath no one uh, than to lay down their life for a friend. Uh, so love was tried for crimes uh, not even committed uh, and the court of evil found love guilty uh, and sentenced love to death uh, and love was crucified uh, on an old rugged cross uh, and over 2,000 years ago um, love died. Uh, love died for you uh, and love died for me uh, and love died deep into the grave but I'm so glad to know um, that death couldn't keep love down. Uh, I'm so glad to know uh, that love was and is so strong uh, that love went to hell, uh, snatched up the keys to death uh, and the grave, uh, and that love showed that old devil who was in charge, uh, that love overcame evil then, uh, and love is commanding us uh, to overcome evil in the world even now. Wow. So, pleasant hope, and those of you watching from far and near, if we truly want to know revolutionary love, we are going to have to get a hold of real love. I'm not talking about Cupid and his arrows, because Cupid may be cute, but Cupid can't shoot revolutionary love. We're going to have to get a hold of real love. And no, I'm not talking about Mary J. Blige and her version of real love. Because even though Mary J. might give you a beat to bop your head to, Mary J.'s singing can't dispense revolutionary love. But no, another good Baptist preacher, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. Philosopher Carl Jung said, where love rules, there is no will to power. And where power predominates, there love is lacking. The one is the shadow of the other. And these men, they're right in their words, and they're good. But I'm not talking about either of those kinds either. I'm talking about the love that is spelled J E S. U S. Not the Jesus fashioned after our own ideas about who he is. Not the Jesus that we put in the Sunday go to meeting box. Not the Jesus that co-signs our brand of morality, but I'm talking about the Jesus about whom John writes. For God so loved the world that God gave Jesus that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm talking about 
the Jesus who is both a prime ancestor and a promised sojourner with whom we will be reacquainted at the eschatological end of all things. Have you tried him? Do you know him for yourself? If you've never tried him for yourself, I mean, truly tried him for yourself, I recommend Jesus. I recommend completely and fully giving him your heart. I recommend giving Jesus access to those spaces and places that you've put the velvet rope up. I recommend giving Jesus an all access pass to your life, to your mind, your body, and your spirit, because I just believe that Jesus alone is the giver of revolutionary love. Because just like that song we all learned when we were but babies, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Sing it where you are. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Oh, yes, Jesus loves me. For the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves me. And it, my friends, is a revolutionary love. God bless you. God keep you. Amen. Family, I hope you really enjoyed that word today from Reverend Gladden. That was a remarkable word. And right here at Pleasant Hope, we have so many things that we offer to not just this Pleasant Hope branch, but also to the community. We have Rita's Freedom Cross School, but we we have, a, it's an African-centered school, and it's teaching about things that many of us, like you and me, have not learned in school. And also we have the Black Church Food Security Network that provides jobs and, and opportunity for all those who, who are, uh, have food shortages, not just in Baltimore family, but all throughout the entire East Coast, right here at Pleasant Hope. And you can be a part of and helping out. And if you'd like to donate, please, by all means, you can go to www.pleasanthope.org. That's our website. And just click on the button where it says give. Or you can go to Cash App at dollar sign, Pleasant Hope BC. That's dollar sign, Pleasant Hope BC. Or we have Givelify and Venmo. But by all means, family, whatever you do, God allows us to offer up time, talent, and treasure. So right here at Pleasant Hope, we are doing all the three. And God is really blessing this place in Zion. So before we go to the benediction, I want to thank you again for all that you do right here at Pleasant Hope Baptist Church. And let us go to prayer for the benediction. May the love of God in the sweet communion of God's Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide in each of us, henceforth, now, and forevermore. May we all say amen, amen, amen. Thank you, family, and we look forward to seeing you right here next week. <laughs>